Morning, guys. This is Nyang Nguyen, and welcome back for another episode of this podcast. And we've got a good friend of mine, Howard Cutler. How you going, buddy? Oh, well, thanks, Nyang. And yourself? Yeah, excellent, mate. Excellent. It's a beautiful uh, Friday morning in uh, sunny, good old uh, Sunshine State. But um, yeah, Howard is, a, like I said, a good friend of mine. He's also a very good uh, surveyor from ONF Surveyors. And he's going to be talking about, you know, what he's up to in the marketplace as a surveyor and what he's observing, because obviously a lot of people who are doing developments, whether it is land subdivisions or townhouses or apartments, need a surveyor. So, Howard, um, yeah, what's your background, buddy? And give us a, an idea of what you do and how you help people um, in the marketplace. Okay. Um, I'll just go a little bit on the background. I'll, I'll start with the family side of things. I married Jenny, 35 years. Uh, nice. Long-suffering Jenny. We've got uh, three children, uh, third grandchild on the way in the next couple of days, so that's pretty exciting. Congratulations, mate. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, married 35 years, but I've been surveying a lot longer. I've been surveying 45 years. I, I finished school in 75 when Brock Whitlam got ousted from the government and uh, <laughs> finished school on the Friday, started work on the Monday. Uh, it was a different way of studying surveying then. It was a university degree, but uh, it was spread over six years. So there's a lot of practical experience along the way, which, which appealed to me. Uh, I got into surveying my, uh, for two reasons. One, I saw a BHP exploration ad and I thought, yeah, I want to go west sometime and do work. And the other one was my uncle. Um, he's a real estate agent and his office was next door to a surveyor. And he said, these guys have a pretty good life. So... I took his advice, uh, went along with it. Uh, 45 years later, I'm, I'm still doing it. Had a few career changes along the way. Oh, not career changes, but just different types of surveying along the way. Mm. I, um, I started actually with a company called My Realty in Brisbane. They had their own surveyor. They were doing a lot of acreage subdivision. Um, but, uh, when I graduated, I decided to go west and I was with an oil exploration company for nearly 10 years, having a good time traveling over the countryside. Um, came time to have have our first uh, baby, the uh, same one who's having her baby next week, uh, decided to settle down. I, I took a steady job with the government, which coincidentally Jenny applied for that job for me. And I was a wonderful, wonderful person according to uh, her application. I somehow scored the job. Uh -huh. It a lot longer in the government than I anticipated, but it was good experience in terms of both surveying and seeing the titling side of things. Mm. Um, but in the end, the bureaucracy got to me. I sort of had, a, had, had enough of that. The opportunity came to buy in at uh, ONF Surveyors. And uh, that was probably one of the best moves I've made career-wise. Uh, ONF Surveyors is a, a company that was established in Kingaroy. Um, when I came along, I operated from home uh, on the Sunshine Coast here. Uh, in the time I've been with them, we've, we've grown. We've got an office here now. Um, two directors and we have six surveyors on staff here. So it's a few mouths to feed, a lot of, uh, a lot of work goes through, through, uh, through the door. Um, and one other thing, well, I suppose one little known fact about me is I've also uh, done the poor man's way of the law degree through the Barristers Board of Queensland. I've passed their exams, but uh, at the end of that, decided it wasn't really for me. So mm -hmm. went straight back into surveying and uh, haven't looked back since. So um, I'm going to have surveyors. We, we, we basically survey anything. Um, one day we might be out on a boat, Jason's boat, or, or a jet ski doing soundings in a river. Uh, we do a lot of work for developers, um, a lot of work for people in, in your group, Young. King or Roy, they, do a lot, they can be doing anything from one day to the next, involving the power station out there, coal mines, farmers wanting to cut up their blocks, putting out irrigation. Yeah, so we cover the whole range of surveying, but more specifically to you is, is um, in Brisbane, we concentrate pretty much on, on small scale uh, property development, unit development, um, splitter blocks. And we do a lot of boundary identification surveys for people who are wanting to have a fight with their neighbours over a retaining wall or a fence or uh, wanting to put in a new fence. So that's a little bit of the background about ONF and, and where I come from. Yeah, very good, very good. And so uh, mainly, what is the objective of uh, being a surveyor? Because some of the uh, listeners on this uh, podcast, they'll be beginners, right? Where they're probably just renovating a house or 
you know, um, looking to subdivide a block. So when does a surveyor get involved and what things do they do um, that are essential for a development you find? Well, I suppose fundamentally a surveyor is an expert measurer. So a surveyor's role is in quantifying what you've got uh, initially in a project. Um, and then as things go by, there's times when you will actually have to have a surveyor like when you're preparing a survey plan for a subdivision or something like that. Mm. So um, one is actually picking up stuff and the other one is sort of setting out new lots and then preparing a plan that goes on for registration. Uh, I suppose advice I'd have to inexperienced people is have the surveyor involved early in the piece because at the end of the day, uh, it'll probably cost about the same whether you have this involved from day one or whether you suddenly realise halfway through the project, oh, golly, I forgot my surveyor. I better get someone on board now. So we could have been out there um, identifying a particular issue with the block of land, um, finding out whether a house is too close to a boundary to allow a side access and, and things like that is, is what we do as, as bread and butter stuff for, for smaller um, mum and dad investors, I suppose, property developers. Yeah, and, and I find it's interesting because sometimes when people start out, like I did with my first property investment, you know, I didn't need a surveyor. I didn't know what a surveyor was. I thought I did, you know. Um, however, it wasn't until I started doing uh, multiple projects that involved multiple dwellings that you need a surveyor. So, you know, because you generally, let's say you watch TV and you're doing the block or something. I want to do my block when I watch those shows. Uh, you don't need a survey necessarily because you're just uh, modifying an existing house, painting, you know, ripping out some walls. Um, but when you're uh, building a house, you need a surveyor, but generally the builder organizes that. Um, I found in, in the analogy of um, a surveyor, it's kind of like a building in pest and, and to find the facts really, when, when you're buying a house and you're looking to invest or just own occupy, you generally get a building in pest it's, and you get a solicitor, that's normal. Um, however, when you're doing a development, let's say a one into three townhouses or one into three subdivision or two subdivision, you need a survey to measure things up. I'll just give you a couple of examples just for listeners here. Uh, I remember one property, uh, I was keeping the house and wanted to measure the distance from the side of the house to the boundary to see if I could fit in a driveway or a second dwelling, something like that. Uh, and a surveyor came in and obviously Howard did that, Howard's team did it for us and did it very promptly as well. So I think, yeah, I relate the survey as a building and pest report. You do it right at the beginning, uh, a survey plan, a layout plan to, to figure out what, what you've actually got and what's reality because like um, Howard was talking about before is fighting about the boundaries is, yeah, the where the fence is doesn't necessarily mean that's where the boundary is. Um, and you, you like to generally measure that from the side of the house or the back of the house as a rear setback or a side setback, but it's not necessarily the case. So, um, yes, what, what's some mistakes that new, newbie developers make there, Howard, that you've experienced over time that's kind of bitten on them, uh, bitten them on the backside? Oh, I suppose it's not having a surveyor involved early, and, mm. and we have um, people... Uh, who've been at a final stage of having a carport or an extension and they need certification at the end, like an as constructed thing. Uh, people often forget that they've got to have certification at the end and surveyors are involved there. Mm. Um, we we can't jump into bed with the devil. If we find something wrong, mm. uh, we're obligated under uh, our professionalism to not certify, basically. So yeah. things can be rectified. We've had carports built. 400 mils across the boundary, 400 millimetres across the boundary, that has to be fixed. So it's a case of, for us to go and certify something, we might as well have set it out to start with because that makes the certification a given at the end. So it's a very mm. quick thing to certify it, whereas it costs about the same to certify something as what it does to actually set it out at the start. So yeah. uh, get a surveyor involved sooner rather than later uh, is my number one piece of advice. Mm. Another one for... Um, or people in property is don't forget the um, the end as constructed survey. We find time and time again um, it, it's either forgotten or not accounted for. Sure. And the utility providers and local governments are just getting more and more stringent on their requirements. Mm. So the cost of as constructed is almost as much as the cost of actually putting the pegs in the ground and doing the subdivision because they're requirements are so onerous so that that's a, a big one that we find all the time people forget and the other thing with as constructed is um 
they forget to call us out and we can't do an as constructed on something if it's already buried. So that makes it a little bit difficult. Mm. And if people read the plans, or it's usually a contractor thing, but contractors often put it back onto the developer that they don't, uh, they don't account for as constructed or set out in their, in their construction contract. And it's put onto the developer or the owner. Mm. And mm. that can be a surprise as well, because set out and as constructed, I said, can be a significant cost in the overall scheme of things. So it's something that you really want to think about early in the piece rather than when push comes to shove at the end and you need need your as constructed, you need your plans, uh, you need your... your as cons. That's a pass yeah. to your council. Yeah, that's, so right. that's, that's the right. main thing, I suppose. Yeah, look, absolutely. And here's the thing is a lot of these listeners will probably have never looked at a subdivision or, and if they have, there's probably in the early throes of doing a one into two or a splitter or just subdividing off the backyard of the house that they live in. So they're kind of just walking around in the dark trying to figure this out. And I don't blame them. When I took did my first subdivision application, it took me six months to lodge the DA. <laughs> um, these days, uh, yeah, it'll take me probably yeah, one day to make all the phone calls and then another week to, to push it all along and lodge ASAP subject to the bottleneck. So I'm just going to share, Howard, with the listeners a couple of things and how I've worked with you uh, as a surveyor to help me along just to, to give some people some insight that it's not just jargon. I know some people, you know, you've been talking about as cons and set outs and things like that. And you and I, that's everyday industry talk. But for people, it's uh, uh, everyday people are laymen going, you know, I, I have no idea what you're talking about. And they get lost and they lose the conversation. So just a, a couple of things when you start starting out with the subdivision um, and correct me with the terminology, mate, I, I suppose it's not, um, yeah, I, I may not have the terminology right, but I know what hopefully I'm talking about is, for example, you've got 800 square meters or a thousand meters. And like I said before, you get a uh, survey plan uh, and a layout plan that essentially lays out the two to three blocks on that block, uh, on that block of land in, on paper. It shows where the trees are, that the, um, the contours, where the existing driveways are, where the existing surveys are services are sorry with existing services are that's one way uh, another way that uh, Howard's worked with us is for example if I'm wanting to market land and I want to put the pegs in so that at least I can put the uh, flags up or the bunting technically called uh, flags up to show where the blocks are that that's very very important uh, the other thing that Howard talked about was uh, the set out there's a couple of set outs I believe one of them is a, what's called a civil set out where the um, the marks are put in so that the civil contractors know where to uh, mark from for their pipes, sewer water, storm water, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then also, there's, so there's paperwork to be done. There's also physical pegs to be installed and stakes to be installed. Uh, and then the other thing is what's called a survey plan itself, an SP, which is a documentation that needs to be authorized from someone like yourself. So that's lodged with council at the end, signed off so that we can uh, lodge for the official plan and for the titles office to be able to register. So the council needs to sign off on that. It's called plan sealing. And then you lodge that with the titles office once you've got your other uh, form 18s, which is from the bank, et cetera, et cetera. So um, anything you want to add to that, mate? I know I've just done a bit of a whirlwind bits and pieces off the top of my head, uh, but I know you do it every day and some of it uh, might trigger some, um, yeah, the things that you do for people. Yeah, no, you've summed it up pretty well there. At the end of the day, only the surveyor can uh, sign that survey plan. Your solicitor can't do it, your engineer can't do it. So, yeah. and, and for, for um, consulting surveyors, that's really the cream at the end of a project is that final survey plan. Um, yeah. Uh, for that very reason that we, we're accepting professional responsibility for for it and uh, it's what we do. Um, yeah, but you covered it pretty well there, Young. So uh, sorry if I used a bit of jargon there earlier, but uh, yeah, we're always open to talk to anybody and, and uh, I think a number of uh, people uh, who you've mentored and that through the time uh, have rung us and, and, you know, we spend half an hour on the phone and we, we talk through some of this jargon with them, like um, they'll ring and say, well, We've got our first project, what do we do? And then we'll give them some advice on that uh, quite readily and happy to do that. Yeah. And that's the thing I do like about how in terms of clients working with yourself is they're able to access yourself. You don't just write them off and say, you know what, here's another newbie um, because this newbie could end up like a, a client who's doing a five lot, 10 lot in two to three years time, right? And you've got clients of mine who are doing that, who've done multiple deals, repeat business. Hopefully they get easier to deal with um, because their trust level with you gets higher. Um, maybe they don't, hopefully they don't get too demanding and uh, don't ask for too many discounts. So, uh, yeah, it's interesting you, uh, you mentioned that repeat business and that's that's sort of a measure of our success in that people do come back to us. Yeah. Um, just 
an interesting story with something that's happened on the Sunshine Coast. There was one property developer up here who who does uh, between 50 and 150 lots a year. Uh, he was using, uh, I won't name the other company, but it's the largest survey company in Queensland to do his project. And he found exactly what you just mentioned then. There was no sort of personal contact, even though he was doing a lot of work through them. Mm. Uh, he didn't have that point of contact and he didn't have that personal relationship with the company. Mm. Um, so what they did is they got us involved in one duplex, which um, for them was small, but it was basically a test for us. Yeah. And since then, we've been doing all their development, which is, yeah. which is sort of a lot of money for us. But mm. they appreciated that they had a point of contact with one of the directors and a level of service that they weren't getting previously. So we pride ourselves on our service. And yep. uh, yeah, that's, that was a good, good success story for us, that one. Yeah, no, look, I really commend you for that, Howard. I know this is going on the record, but mate, the amount of energy it must take for you to bloody keep on top of the stuff, because mate, I know I'm not the easiest client to deal with. I want mm -hmm. things done, I want things done now. Um, but I'm more than happy to one, pay the bills and two, refer business. So it's uh, one of those things that, uh, as you show, um, yeah, your, your level of service to us, we do appreciate your mate, level of uh, contribution to everybody and, and making our jobs uh, easier to get on with it because uh, sometimes we're on strict deadlines. So, um, yeah, yeah. Look, yeah, so, um, yeah, just a com bit of commentary on, on the marketplace, mate. So uh, moving on, like uh, we were just having a bit of banter before the start of the call. Uh -huh. um, yeah, what, what's uh, what's the latest in the uh, since the Home Builders Grant, or, or did it pick up a little bit before that? Yeah, it's funny for us because somehow we jag being on um, JobKeeper, um, comparing our April uh, turnover to April last year, but just pure pure fluke. April last year was a huge month for us, whereas mm. this year was sort of normal, but it was a huge difference. And that was what we're measured on for job keeping. But <laughs> we've been we've been busier over the last month or so than we have been for a long time. Mm. Uh, particularly the level of stuff just in the last week, where people are jumping back into something that they might have been sitting on for a while. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's funny you talk to different town planners and developers. Uh, some say that it's quiet and others say that it's, they've never been busier. And mm. I think we're in that latter case that it, it is busy at the yeah. moment. And it's a lot of that one into two stuff, um, yeah. building stuff. Uh, we've had a, another one into 25 lots in Nambour. Uh, we just got the go ahead on this week. Mm. I got a one into 40 in Gympie that's kicking off in the next couple of weeks. So there's, there's definitely that confidence out there. I think it's, it's the land for the build that's mm. going to happen. People want to get it going and they want to get it going fairly quickly at the moment. Mm, yeah. So in those uh, couple of instances, I find it interesting, um, obviously not sure which level that you're at because uh, the Home Builders Grant is looking at expiring in December, 31st of December. Hopefully it'll get extended. But um, yeah. with those two examples there in Ambor and Gympie, it's very unlikely they'll meet those deadlines. So what's your take on that? Or is it just the fact that they've got other stock in the pipeline that's going to go to market and um, be registered in time and these ones will just be a more pipeline stock for the next round of 2021? Uh, yeah, I think people are expecting it to extend past December. Um, mm. Yeah, I really don't know. It's crystal ball stuff, really. Of course. But <laughs> always. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know. The government's got to run out of money sooner or later, so who knows? <laughs> Oh, look, I find it fascinating. Um, but I think I even if the uh, grant finishes in December, I think that the key thing is that the momentum will be there. I've done the maths on it, you know, 660, 688 million at uh, 27,000 grants. I've done the maths at an average of 500 grand. Let's say the debt is roughly, you know, 450 grand. I did the maths. It was um, just multiply it by five, roughly. It's uh, $3.5 uh, billion worth of stimulus b raised on debt, you know? So it's yeah. uh, e either way, it's a lot of money. I may not have my mm. numbers quite right, but either way, that 25 grand uh, stimulus will uh, multiply many, many, many times over based on the debt that people spend. And yeah, it'll flow through people like yourself, through people like myself and uh, who are in the industry and uh, yeah, there to be able to support people through this process, whether it's um, educating people. Obviously, probably more so back to the government as well. 
Oh, absolutely, exactly. mate. Oh, yeah. yeah, for sure. Look, I was just thinking about, I was calculating the GST on the land that I got to pay, uh, contributions to the government or the council, um, obviously GST in your instance, income tax as well. Um, and the people who are doing home buys, uh, and I know we're not really getting to the economics or the politics of this, but no. that's been top of my mind. And I know that you can uh, propagate this conversation is um, yeah, all the income that uh, that's used to pay off the repayments is going to be after tax dollars. Yep. as well exactly. so um yeah so look I, I think it's very very clever what they've done to be able to stimulate it not just one-to-one like you know the job keeper's great one-to-one um every dollar they put in the economy goes flows back but here with a 25k multiply that um put it into 500k that's actually 20 to 1 um in terms of multiplying the stimulus anyway and and it's going to be after tax dollars when they make those repayments as well yep. so it's probably going to be 100 to 1 uh, but anyway, it's a, it's a great stimulus thing. And um, yeah, we're all, we're all in good shape either way. We'll survive this uh, good old uh, pandemic and get through the other side. So um, yeah. anything else? Um, yeah, how do people get in touch with you, Champ, and uh, find out more about your services? And um, yeah, how can they work with you? Uh, we've got our website, um, onfsurveyors.com.au. Um, I uh, freely put out my mobile number, office number, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, always up for a chat. Um, a lot of our business is done by email. We don't have a lot of face-to-face contact with clients anymore. It's just one thing I like, uh, attending property group meetings and, and webinars and things like that, just so people can put a face to a name. But uh, yeah, sure. yeah, no, we're easily accessible. And, and as I said earlier, we pride ourselves in all our work. You're, you're dealing directly with one of one of the directors of the company. Um, yeah. We do put some when once you get a personal uh, relationship with some of our our guys who are actually out doing stuff, feel free to ring them. But yeah, the directors are all all involved. Very good, mate. Yeah, and I'll put your URL on the bottom of this uh, podcast show notes, and then people can click on that and access you there. So, mate, thanks again. Thanks for your time. I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, put the time pleasure. aside, have a chat to us. So that's uh, Howard Cutler from O and F Surveys, guys. This is Young Nguyen signing off. Have a great day, and catch you next time. All the best. Thanks. Thank you.